on this Labor Day weekend, I have a con confession to make to you. I wish I could be bringing you a word of comfort. Something like, come to me all who labor and I will give you rest. That's a famous saying of Jesus, which has brought millions of people comfort over the centuries. Unfortunately, that is not our text for today. Instead, the gospel passage for this 16th Sunday after Pentecost is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. It's a passage that states quite strongly and directly Jesus demands for any of, of, any of us who would like to be followers. The demands put forth in this passage about discipleship are perhaps the strongest and the most radical in all of the New Testament. Let us listen now for God's word as it comes to us today. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The word of the Lord. As our passage begins, we are told that Jesus is traveling along with large crowds following him. And as he travels, he takes this opportunity to teach the crowds about the cost of discipleship. Whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, spouse and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even one's own life, cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And after sharing two quick stories about the importance of counting the cost before starting a major project, Jesus ends with this summary. Therefore, none of you who are unwilling to give up all of your possessions can be my disciple. Maybe Jesus was just feeling overwhelmed or overloaded or simply having a bad day. Maybe he was just happy to work with the 12 who were his closest followers, and in frustration, he decided to set the bar very high for the enthusiastic crowds who were traveling with him. Maybe there are other ways to interpret these verses. Maybe we should not take them so literally. Maybe. You see, this week I have wrestled with this passage, and I've been tempted to find a way to take off its edge. Did Jesus really want us to hate those who are closest to us, our father and mother, our spouses and children, our brothers and sisters? Hate really is not a family value, is it? And giving up all of your possessions, what good is that going to do? Could he just settle for us, perhaps giving up 10% or maybe even 15%? As I thought, creatively about ways to possibly water down this passage, an interesting thing happened. The closer I looked at the entire story of Jesus told in Luke's Gospel, it became clear to me that these words of Jesus were not simply isolated ones. They were not outliers. No, the themes expressed here in our passage today are consistent with the themes set forth throughout the Gospel. Let's begin with family. Early on in Luke's Gospel, we have the story of the 12-year-old Jesus 
on the annual family trip to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Jesus goes off on his own in the temple, and it's days later before his parents even notice that he's gone. When Jesus is found by his frantic parents, he tells his mother, why are you even searching for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? My father's house, that's father with a capital F. So Jesus is not referring to Joseph, but to God. Skip over a few pages to chapter four, when Jesus delivers his first sermon in the hometown of Nazareth, preaching good news to the poor and release to those who are captive, he receives no honor, but instead he is almost thrown off of a cliff. As his ministry grows and Jesus calls disciples who leave everything to follow him, we hear not about Mother Mary, but we hear about another Mary, Mary named Magdalene, and other women who provide for the disciples out of their own resources. They even regularly house the disciples who otherwise would be homeless. And in chapter 8, when Jesus is told his mother Mary and his brothers are outside waiting in line trying to see him but are blocked because of the crowds, Jesus says this, my mother and brothers are not my biological ones. They are the ones who hear God's word and do it. And a few verses later, the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, the one who touches Jesus' garment and is blessed, Jesus calls her daughter. And when a woman in the crowd gives a shout out to Jesus' mother Mary, saying to Jesus, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Jesus counters with this. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and do it. So you see the point in Luke's gospel. When it comes to calling disciples, Jesus frames family in a much different way than we do in our culture. Biological family is not something to be blindly cherished or adored. Rather, in the gospel story, obligations to our biological family often become stumbling blocks to those who are seeking to follow Jesus. Take, for instance, the turning point of the gospel in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. We are told that Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem, meaning he's on a journey to the place where he will face opposition and rejection and eventually death. A few verse, verses later, we hear would-be followers saying to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go bury my father. To this reasonable excuse, Jesus says this, let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another would-be follower says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me say first farewell to those who are at my home. Jesus responds, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And in the parable Jesus tells of the great banquet, the one that is immediately before our passage this morning, in this parable, those who are first invited all make excuses about why they're not coming. I have just been married, therefore I cannot come. I have just bought a piece of land. I must go and see it. Please accept my regrets. I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Throughout Luke's story, we see clearly that the call to respond to Jesus' invitation to discipleship involves a total and radical commitment. There is no way to water it down. Our allegiance must be first and foremost to God and God's reign in the world. The gospel story is very clear about calling out the things that get in the way of us making that commitment to God. And honestly, the things that are named throughout Luke's gospel as the primary barriers for those who seek to be followers of Christ 
are rather surprising to me. It's not the temptation to sin or the temptation to turn towards things that are inherently bad for us, behaviors like stealing or hurting another or simply failing to do the right thing. No, surprisingly enough, the things that are named as the primary barriers to our discipleship have to do with our allegiance to our families and our allegiance to our possessions. These are the things that we often have good reason to cherish. Family and possessions are things that sustain us in life and bring us much value and meaning. But does Jesus really want us to hate our families? This issue has been a source of much controversy in the area of biblical interpretation. And even the Gospels do not agree with each other. In Matthew's Gospel, there's a parallel passage, and Jesus does not use the word hate there. Instead, Jesus says this, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So according to Matthew, Jesus really doesn't want us to put our love and loyalty to him above anything else, including family and including our possessions. Biblical scholars suggest that in Luke's passage, when Jesus says we are to hate those who are closest to us, the word being used here is not meant to be taken literally to denote emotional hate, such as anger and hostility, Rather, it appears that Jesus is using a literary device, a hyperbole, that exaggerates the contrast between two things, so as to make his point. The point is that loyalty to Jesus should trump every other loyalty pulling at our hearts, whether it's loyalty to family, to country, to our own securities, to our possessions. These lesser loyalties should never be in competition with our allegiance to Jesus. Using language such as hating these lesser loyalties is much more powerful than just saying, put God first, love God more, and then place love of family and country and possessions second, third, or fourth. No, it's not that easy. In comparison to our commitment to following Jesus, our other loyalties should not just take the silver and bronze places. No, loyalty to Jesus should redefine all of our other commitments. And things that we are tempted to over-treasure, such as our families and material possessions, the power these things have over us must be let go of. But what does this look like in the real world? The fishermen in Jesus' day may have left their nets and their families behind in the boat. But what does discipleship look like for us? I'd like to share with you a couple of stories that may help us to think about what it means for us to be disciples today. Recently, I heard a story told by Will Willimon. Will is a Methodist preacher who served as dean of the chapel at Duke University for years. Willimon once shared an encounter that he had with the father of a student who was about to graduate. The father called Willimon's office and exploded over the phone. I hold you personally responsible for this, he yelled at Willimon. The father was angry because his graduate school bound daughter had decided, in his father's words, to throw it all away and go and do mission work in Haiti with the Presbyterian Church. The father screamed, isn't that absurd? She has a Bachelor of Science from Duke University and she's going to dig ditches in Haiti. I hold you responsible for that. Willimon, who was apparently not easily intimidated, asked him, why are you holding me responsible? And the father replied, you ingratiated yourself and filled her with all of this religion stuff. And Dr. Willimon was quick to reply, Sir, weren't you the one who had her baptized? Well, well, yes, the father stumbled and 
And did you take her to Sunday school when she was a little girl? Well, uh, yes. And did you allow your daughter to go on those youth group trips and conferences when she was in high school? Yes, but what does that have to do with anything? And the father was becoming more and more agitated. Sir, Willeman concluded, you are the reason that she is throwing this all away. You introduced her to Jesus, not me. But, said the father, all we wanted was a Presbyterian. <laughs> and Willeman replied, well, sorry, sir, you messed up. You've gone and you've made a disciple. Like the dad in Willman's story, we may have expecta expectations for others that are contrary to the call to the discipleship. Even if we believe that we would never be as extreme as that Duke father, today's passage warns us that allegiance to the family system is indeed powerful. I love that the young woman in the story was willing to go out on her own to the mission field but that is not always easy to do. I wonder how much influence she received from members of her faith family, adults who nurtured her growing up at church, the influence of her peers, and yes, even the guidance from the college chaplain. The fact that we who are baptized in, into, into Christ belong to a body of believers beyond our biological family is truly a revolutionary and countercultural reality. When we celebrate an infant baptism, we joyfully announce that the child has been adopted into a new family, the family of God. If we really take this seriously, we are acknowledging that ultimately our kids do not belong to us, they belong to God. I believe that parenting really is about letting go letting our kids become the unique persons that God has created them to be, the persons that God is calling them to be. Whether it's answering the call to be a mission worker in Haiti or a doctor in Chicago or a teacher in Fairview, we are called to hear and respond to the gospel's invitation to share the boundary-breaking love of Christ through our whole lives. In closing, I share with you a story about two people who have been models for me in sharing the boundary-breaking love of God. Tom and Stevie Hoffman were members here a few years ago. Some of you may know them. Like others of you, Tom and Stevie retired here to Asheville, but they still like to travel. The Hoffmans regularly volunteered with Heifer International as well as with the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Agency. And this would take them away from time for a, you know, a period of, of a month or so. Before leaving on some adventure, Tom came by my office one day and said he needed to talk to me. We're going to be gone for a number of weeks and our home in Swannanoa will be sitting there empty. And Tom handed me the keys to his place along with basic instructions about the alarm and utilities. Why are you giving these keys to me? I asked Tom. Well, in case there's some emergency or there's a need in the congregation, I want y'all to have access to our home. You never know what might come up. Though I didn't tell Tom this at the time, I was initially thinking that this was a little strange. Uh, maybe well-meaning, but really not a necessary thing to do or something to burden me with. <laughs> well, several weeks passed and the Hoffman's keys stayed in my office drawer, out of sight and out of mind. But then something else happened. An unusual pastoral situation um, developed with another family in our congregation. Because of a crisis situation, there was a need to relocate um, a family for a few weeks. And it turned out that the Hoffman's house became the safe haven that was needed. This story has, has struck me in my heart over the years because I believe it illustrates how we as the family of God take care of each other in ways that are often 
quiet and faithful, yet very powerful. We visit each other. We take meals to each other. We even house each other. We do this because we've become family. The Hoffmans um, also show a concrete example, I think, of how God wants to relate to our possessions. At the end of our passage in verse 33, the verb that we translate give up or let go literally, literally means to say farewell to, or to say goodbye. So we are not to hold on to our possessions as if they really belong to us. We're not to hold on to them because of our need for security. Rather, we must be willing to let go of them in service of the gospel, literally to say goodbye to them. Now, how this plays out for each of us may be different. It may be letting go of something tangible like a car or a house to benefit another, or choosing to invest in a mission that can continue after you die, or it may be something else. But whatever form our letting go takes, as disciples, we know that the one who calls us to follow is also the one who loves us and has given us everything we will ever need. For in our baptism, we have said goodbye to our old selves, and we have received a new identity as God's beloved. My friends, today Jesus is calling us to live more fully into the baptized life. He is calling us to let go of our old identity and embrace the reconstruction of a new identity, an identity based not on our possessions or our family ties, but rather on the basis of belonging to a new community, a community oriented to God's values, oriented to God's purposes, one, one that's characterized by faithfulness to the message of God's love and God's justice for all. So as we prepare this morning to share the family meal, which we will share at this table, may we find strength and courage for the journey that lies ahead of us, knowing that in life and in death we belong to God and we belong to each other. All praise be to God. Amen.